Welcome to this presentation. In the next half an hour, I'm going to present a solution for axisymmetric compression test by taking into account the barreling. The reason for doing the test is to find the constitutive parameters of a certain material, but the problem is that friction add some uncertainties into the test results reduction into constitutive parameter so if we know the friction beforehand then the conversion of load displacement of the compression sample into flow stress uh, would become more more accurate in the existing solutions certain amount of friction is assumed and that assumption um, can bring some errors into data conversion and then as a consequence the constitutive descriptions can, uh, cannot be accurate enough so what we do in this presentation, we try to separate the constitutive behavior at the first stage just by looking at the geometry changes and how much barreling taking place during a certain test. We would present a solution to find the friction just based on the barrel geometry. And once the geometry is known, then we have a more accurate correlation between the load displacement measurement by the compression test into constitutive parameters and when it comes to hot deformation particularly this is of um, importance because it allows us a more exact simulation of hot forming processes so let's start with traditional solution of the test here we start with a cylindrical sample initial dimensions and after some certain time the height is reduced by a stroke y and these solutions the geometry remains cylindrical no barreling as we see in the, in the second slide and the ram is moving by velocity of h dot instantaneous height is represented by h velocity field because of the axisymmetric nature of the problem can be described by three velocity components in three directions but because there's no torsion involved we can assume the third velocity component is zero So one thing we notice with the conventional solution is that the effective strain rate is related to the punch stroke velocity and instantaneous height. But the same strain rate um, applies throughout the sample. It doesn't change in different position of the sample. Also, the dependence of the strain rate to the stroke in a differential way um, brings some, some requirement for the test. The requirement is because typically we want to have constitutive data for a certain temperature and certain strain rate. We would like to keep the strain rate constant throughout the test. So for doing that, one needs to apply the stroke as a function of time in an exponential way. So if this is fulfilled, then we can secure a constant strain rate throughout the test. So how this is currently done, depending on what test equipment you are using, hopefully your test provider, test machine provider, has some electronic ways by using different softwares and hardware they are enforcing this, this relationship to ensure that you are getting one strain rate throughout the test otherwise um, that that results and their conversion should be um, 
considered um, carefully. So this is a strain rate. If we integrate the strain rate through a streamline, we can work out the total effective plastic strain, and that eventually is proportional to the strain rate by the elapsed time. Because typically compression test is for hot characterization and temperature is involved, so we would like to introduce a constitutive, an empirical constitutive equation which takes into account variation of temperature with activation energy, so we introduce the zener holloman parameter. This is the typical correlation between the compression force with stress and instantaneous geometrical parameters B and H. Also, we see the correlation is through the constant friction coefficient M. Also, one can use the initial configuration parameters rather than the instantaneous final dimensions to make the correlation between force and stress and friction. So if you want to go forward from here to convert the load displacement, load stroke displacement into flow stress, we have to have reasonable um, assumption for friction coefficient. But how this friction can be measured because because this friction is specific to this very test so whatever we have measured for for other deformation might not be ap applicable here so that's why in this research i'm going to show you a result at the preliminary stage to calculate the friction coefficient first without um, concerning about the constitutive behavior just by looking at the barreling and barreling behavior and the dimensions we work out the friction that means the friction we are estimating is specific to this test now that we hopefully know the friction accurately we are able to convert the load displacement into um, fluid stress data so that is not the case for the conventional um, techniques because as we see these are not taking into account barreling and everything here is by just using some imaginary value for, for M which might not be true. So in order to address this problem let's um, consider the geometry changes first. These are two configuration of the test. Um, the initial geometry the final uh, geometry and here the barreling happening so time zero and this is the final time but between these two stages in the middle slide we are showing an intermediate configuration where the upper platen is moving with a velocity of h dot and now we would like to have the radius a typical radius with a distance with a vertical distance of y from the coordinate center um, such that we can describe this disparaling one way of doing that is assuming this barrel is represented by a quadratic expression and that's exactly what we have done here so by some um, geometrical and volume constancy consideration we come up with this expression this correlation radius is a quadratic function of distance from the uh, coordinate system in the vertical direction and instantaneous height and that is difference between two diameters this is lowercase d is diameter between tool and sample also we can express this using the maximum or barrel diameter d uppercase d and lowercase d so that's another way of the same expression now it happens very often that people finish the test and several months later <laughs> they remember uh, they only have recorded the maximum 
diameter and they forgot to measure the uh, tool sample interface diameter the final diameter so um, based on this solution there's no reason to be worried that expression lets you to do the conversion you only need to have the initial dimensions the final maximum diameter and height then you can find an accurate estimation of the tool sample final di diameter this is exactly at the final um, stage when, when T is equal to TF but with the same reasoning we can generalize relationship for a case for, for an intermediate case so lowercase d is a typical case uppercase d is a typical barreling diameter and these are initial and also if initial diameter and height are equal to that of the final this relationship simplifies to d equal to uppercase d which somehow verifies our derivation uh, before we move on once we know the lowercase d uh, we can use these time dimension expressions to express the transient geometry of the sample so here the parameter kappa is introduced the ratio between current time and the final time that's kappa if you know kappa then we can work out lowercase uppercase d and, and delta using the initial configuration next we would like to move into the velocity field so we finish with the geometry now to do the uh, velocities let's consider two main velocity components u dot is vertical velocity field v dot is the radial in the case of the conventional solution here this is the geometry represented by constant diameter a constant value is a zero order polynomial u dot is a constant again that's a zero order polynomial and v dot based on the conventional solution is a varies linearly from maximum at the surface to zero at the second platen. so that changes linearly in other or difference in order of magnitudes between v dot and u dot is one first order zero order now are we able to generalize these relationships between order of polynomials from conventional solution to our solution in other words we have assumed that the geometry is quadratic so why not having v dot u dot it is a vertical velocity component to resemble the geometry here u dot resembles the geometry and because the geometry is quadratic u dot is going to be quadratic too and here v dot is one order of magnitude larger than u dot so here quadratic we should have a cubic to represent v dot so if we use this analogy what we get at is a cubic expression for v dot for which we don't know the coefficient to calibrate this coefficient all we need is four boundary conditions and these are the boundary conditions which I've used there's an inflation point at the half at the mid plane of the sample and these are the four conditions if you apply them um, here V dot is exactly represented using the calibrated coefficients so now we know V dot let's see what else can be calculated we can move into the strain rate components the first one is vertical strain rate component which by definition is um, partial derivative of v dot with respect to y coordinate so that is fully known the next strain component is radial normal radial strain rate component which by definition 
um, can be calculated provided that we know what u dot is at this stage we only know v dot and also if we know u dot we should be able to work out the third normal strain rate component in the ten tangential direction this is by definition but how can we do this let's remember that for incompressibility to hold we need to vanish the uh, dilatometric summation and that expression in conjunction with these two relationship together leads us to a differential equation to be solved if we are able to solve this differential equation then u dot can be worked out and we found the u dot having two terms general and a specific solution but here the solution is singular along the center line to avoid the singularity c is, a, is an arbitrary constant we, we put c1 equal to 0 to avoid the singularity so u dot is just just the first term and this we see is, is a um, quadratic that resembles the, the barrel geometry this is the assumption we start with so now we know u dot we are able to find two other normal strain rate components this is quadratic this is quadratic and identical if you plug these into the definition of effective strain rate this is an interesting observation here contrary to the conventional solution the strain rate is a function of distance from the coordinate system so it's not uniformly distributed in the sample this is contrary to the conventional solution and comparing to finite element solution this is a more realistic uh, assumption so now we finalize the geometry we finalize the strain rates let's apply the upper bound solution to find a relationship between punch force and the stroke all right upper bound theorem is between the different work rates three terms are involved here the first term is internal deformation work rate middle one is velocity discontinuity the last one is traction at the tool sample interface that's in a short internal deformation velocity discontinuity and traction at the two sample interface the middle one is zero velocity field we assume is continuous there is no discontinuity here that's only for a strip line fin solutions and plugging the strain rate into the definition of internal work rate and solving this integral eventually what we get at is the first work rate is a function of punch velocity flow stress lowercase uppercase diameter and for a special case if these two d are equal then we can find that this approaches to the previous solution to the conventional solution and we can choose any constitutive behavior to describe the material behavior but at this stage we are not too concerned about that as, as I mentioned earlier the friction solution we are going to find should be independent of the constitutive behavior and only relying on the geometry changes the last term is constant friction coefficient multiplied by the yield or stress in shear which based on the von Mises uh, criteria can be correlated to the effective stress and if we do the integration that's the final value we find for the tractional work rate and once we plug all values into the upper bound theorem and the left hand side is a work rate performed by the external force so this power is external force multiplied by the ram velocity 
and here we can eliminate RAM velocity from both sides of the equation and eventually that is the correlation between force and constancy based on the lowercase uppercase diameter instantaneous height and before we can use this, this expression which takes into account the barreling for data reduction for load displacement data into fluid stress we have to be sure about the friction and that friction coefficient is not good enough to assume this whatever we measure by other techniques is not exactly applicable to this particular test so how can I find this friction coefficient just by geometrical consideration um, I'm going to show you this next but before doing that for a, for a special case we find out that this relationship becomes very similar to the conventional uh, solution except the friction term is different this has a uh, divided by 3 and that's natural because we, we use a more comprehensive velocity field now going back to how to find friction before using this expression for converting load displacement into constitutive data that question can be answered by um, using total potential energy principle so total potential energy uh, principle it states that there is a balance between internal energy rate u dot and external work rate so external work rate is um, due to friction and um, punch punch load and the first term is due to deformation so we already have calculated w dot and um, u dot so if I plug this from the previous derivation here I have the balance of these two terms or the different residual between these two terms the residual between these two terms we call this a functional and that functional if, if that functional somehow can be minimized it means the residual is zero when, when the residual is zero it means all deformation has been balanced or compromise the external work and this is one way of assuring what kinematically as atmospheric velocity field is um, valid for the solution we are making so that's exactly what I'm going to do and now that I have functional how can I minimize this functional or how can I set the variation of that equal to zero for doing that I need to write this expression in terms of one single primary parameters and that is easy because we remember before lowercase uppercase D H they, they all have been um, represented as a transient geometry in terms of kappa this was part of derivations before so what I do here is next I plug the transient description into the expression and after simplification I have the residual the error residual equal to this one and if I take the derivative of this residual with respect to the primary variable kappa equal to zero that means residual is equal to zero when residual is equal to zero that means I have found a kinematically atmospheric velocity which allows me to have balance between u dot and w dot and that is exactly what I'm going to do next this simple deriv uh, derivation leads me into an expression for M don't let the size of this expression scares you that's very straightforward this means I can find a relatively exact value for friction provided that I know the initial geometric configuration that is simple I need to know the final barrel diameter and tool sample interface diameter even if I don't have the lowercase final diameter I can find this based, based on the derivation I made before so that long derivation is simple to program 
and what it says is if the barrel geometry and initial geometry are known we have a relatively exact derivation for m applicable to this particular test we don't have to borrow the value of m from other metal forming applications which might not apply to here now we are more confident we have the value of m we have a solution to correlate the axisymmetric compression force and the stroke and if if the m is known we are able to make a relatively accurate correlation between constitutive expression and uh, constitutive data obtained from the compression test if i'm going to use a shorter expression here i can make a simplifying assumption i introduce an imaginary diameter called effective diameter and that effective diameter is not the barrel diameter is not the tool di um, tool sample interface diameter but that is something called effective this is an imaginary how do i find it using the volume constancy and based on the initial and current configuration so if i plug these imaginary values approximate values into the residual i still can have an expression a functional of the primary variable kappa again by taking its derivative residual respect to the primary variable and derivative equal to zero so the error is zero and then i come up with a relatively short shorter expression for friction so either with this solution equation 53 or by equation 49 we notice that if these uppercase lowercase diameters are equal m approaches zero that means no barreling and that that physically makes sense all right um, now i'm going to show you finally three simulations which were produced uh, by my student uh, dr Mehdi fardi using abacus the first simulation is thermal simulation here we have a thermal distribution at the start of the test this part of the sample is warmer these are colder so due to the deformation heat we see that this temperature rise builds up and here relatively remains colder it's like a dead zone there now let's have a look at the effective strain rate distribution during the test that is again larger strains here lower strains there and finally we'll have simulation of effective plastic strain throughout the sample so if we run the test the highest strain build up is along the central plane mid plane here is medium deformation and the least deformation takes place near near that dead zone which uh, we had the least uh, temperature built up okay i hope this presentation has provided some insight for you to um, perform the compression test axisymmetric compression test in a more accurate way now you should be able to estimate the friction based on the geometry and once you know the friction uh, based on the, the the exact solution i presented exact i mean taking into account barreling is still isothermal so once you know the friction you are able to comfortably convert your compression test load displacement data into the flow stress behavior and that brings my presentation to its end thank you for listening